Okay. Good. Thank okay. you. Great. Um, okay, so this looks looks fine. Um, I'm going to read. Do you mind if I read back what we understood you to, to say? I'll, I'll just do it briefly. You you read the 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 header of the proposed motion listing the chapters that are proposed to be amended, and then you modified it with in accordance with SB 946 and accepting portions which are not directly applicable to SB 946, comma, and furthermore find that, and then you've included the two uh, paragraphs uh, as set forth, and then you've modified the second one to say, adopt the proposed amendments to the municipal code with the findings reflected in the proposed ordinance, which the planning commission makes as though set forth in, the, in their entirety in this resolution as applicable to SB 946, comma, in substantially the form as shown in said exhibit entitled blah, blah, blah. And my only recommendation here, or our only recommendation would be to add only as applicable to SB 946, just to clarify that we're only, you're only recommending those, those provisions. Okay, so adding the word only to um, item two, so it's only as applicable to SB 946. Yes, and I think to be, um, to, dot our eyes here i guess you should sort of make a friendly amendment to your motion <laughs> okay, so on that. My, okay so my friendly amendment is to add the word only to item two so it's only as applicable to um sb 946 so we had a a motion and a second so we are still at that point is that correct yes. and uh you, you i think believe you need a vote for your friendly amendment uh, oh. uh no, not a vote a, mo a second sorry Oh, may, do I have a second for my friendly amendment? Adding the word only. Yeah, I second. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Saxena. All right. Uh, do we want to deliberate on this anymore or take a vote? Uh, Commissioner Fung? Yeah, I had one question. So one, one of the areas that I think there was some um, concern about in the pre previous discussion, and this is part of why I would actually recommend that we reject the entire thing, um, was the discussion around the 15 minute limit on uh, locating uh, being in a site. Now, I'm curious whether we believe that's part, you know, that was something that was uh, associated with mobile um, services, not with, uh, you know, not with uh, sidewalk services. So do we believe that to be part of this motion or not part of this motion? That that would be, it's my understanding that that would not be part of this motion because that's not applicable to the SB 946. Um, could the attorneys uh, please weigh in on that? Um, I mean, I think uh, it could or it couldn't be. It is not necessarily applicable. The way that the um, the way that it's drafted right now, it, that does apply to roaming sidewalk vendors. Um, that is a restriction that could be imposed on those vendors if you wanted it to. Um, so I guess I'm not, I guess it doesn't necessarily belong or not. Uh, that makes sense. It, it, we don't, it, uh, state law, SB 946 doesn't require that. Um, so that's, that's a restriction I think that staff imposed um, that SB 946 allows the city to impose, but it is not required to. So, so I think that. Uh, thank you very much for that, uh, uh, for that uh, insight. I think that that actually is kind of in that territory. This is actually in the territory of, you know, we want to do uh, SB nine forty forty six compliance as a objective, uh, even if it's not something that's time critical. Uh, however, um, you know, there were a number of things that were in introduced that were associated closely with, but probably not part of. So, I'd, again, I, I would just, I would just say that personally, I oppose. I oppose uh, doing this. I, I would rather see that, uh, you know, we vote this one down and um, and have it come back with a very explicit, you know, this is SB, SB 946 uh, compliance, you know, kind of right to the, you know, these are the areas which are directly conflicted by S9, uh, SB 946, that we correct those and then uh, treat the other ones, you know, um, separately from that. But thanks. Could we clarify with regards to the 15 minutes uh, that is for uh, mobile 
trucks that would have a 15 minute time limit to conduct a transaction in residential areas. And that is not applicable to SB 946, which is regarding sidewalk vendors, mobile and stationary. Hi, Chair Moore, I can take that. So the 15 minute maximum um, that uh, the restriction for them to not exceed 15 minutes to um, do a transaction is applicable to sidewalk vendors, which is under SB 946. That is one that was included just for roaming vendors. So um, as the category of roaming, they should be moving. And when they have to stop for a transaction, um, a 15 minute cap is listed. So is that gone with the motion that I have? Is that 15 minutes with that not, uh, not be included or would it? I think it that's a question for Pardon? It would still be included, yes. Okay, so, good. So, yeah. we're, so the SB, the SB 946, uh, the sidewalk vendor portion is all intact as you have it. Um, is that correct? That's right. Okay, so the so we we still have all the sidewalk ven vendor portion as you presented it, but we are not making any de decisions regarding the, uh, the food trucks, the service trucks, and the the goods trucks. Is that correct? I just want to make sure we've got this perfectly clear. Correct. Okay. All right. So that I, my but motion is that I intended it. It wasn't the point, though, that um, Commissioner Fung was was making was the 15 minute and then that it does apply it as written is applying to roaming sidewalk vendors. Yes, it does. And right. that, that's how they that's how they planned it from right. the from staff. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I would just say that that is in excess of compliance with 946. That's an example of that's well, an example look, of something that was chosen chosen to illustrate that restrictions could be placed beyond the uh, state law well i, I happen to like the 15 minute restriction um on this on the sidewalks like that and and also as we went through sb 946 <laughs> there's only a limited amount of areas in the city where they would actually be able to set up because of the four foot um the four foot passageway uh, that, that that they have it added. Uh, so I I think that yes. I, I like I like it as it is. That's actually another example. The state law we as as we discussed in the uh, hearing, the state law is three and a half feet or three feet, uh, not four feet. Again, that's something where the city has chosen to make a um, chosen to raise you know to impose a standard that goes beyond the state law. And I think it's a wise standard that they've added, especially when you have kids that are going to be on bicycles on the sidewalk. I think having the four feet was a smart choice, and I agree with it. And I think and so I, I was, right at that point, it's an arbitrary number: three and a half feet, four feet, five feet. Why not make it ten feet? So I don't, you know, our, uh, introducing an arbitrary number is, I think, not a wise thing to do. Do we want to continue on this or shall we call the vote? Any further comments? Commissioner Wong? Let's call the let's call right. it. Vice Chair. All right. Madam Clerk, will you call the vote, please? And is this yes, just for the friendly you. amendment? So sorry, is this just for the friendly amendment or is this the whole thing? Uh, this is the whole thing with the friendly with amendment. With the friendly amendment. Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, Vice Vice Chair Wong. Um, no, no, nay. So, Commissioner Takahashi. Okay, now now I'm kind of confused. Um, just to be clear, an I vote is saying we're passing along the parts to be compliant with regard to modifying our city ordinances. And a nay vote is denying the whole thing, right? Yes. Okay. So nay. Uh, actually, sorry is to interject in just a moment, but yes. you have to make a recommendation. So you can only make oh. a recommendation if, if you're making an affirmative vote. 
a, a nay vote is going to mean you're going someone's going to have to make another motion because okay, because a nay vote just 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 scrubs right. this recommendation the nay vote says no recommendation the yay vote says this recommendation is is going forward and councilmen yep. go decide what they want to do with it yeah so if the nays prevail you're going to have to make another recommendation yeah because there needs to be a recommendation Does that make sense right but that would be after we vote we complete yeah, this exactly okay. i just want to make that clear right. yeah. yeah yeah okay uh um could we just specify again what we're voting for the it's the uh, the original proposal with the friendly amendment right the one i seconded like a few minutes ago yes okay cool thank you it's it's only the portion which would affect the sidewalks so these are vendors on the sidewalks okay hold on so this is just just so before I recuse my vote, <laughs> if I have to recuse my vote, yes, uh, yes. I just want to double check here. So, so the existing provisions that were passed by state law, plus an additional provision that's related to sidewalks, is where we're at. It's only sidewalks. SB nine forty six, as far as I understand, is it's only, only for sidewalk vendors. Sidewalk. It's only for sidewalk so, vendors. Right. So personally, for 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 clarity, when this was brought to the planning commission, in my opinion, we should have just had SB nine forty six as an agenda item, and then an entirely separate issue should have been, in my opinion, the uh, the trucks completely separated because this is all we're having trouble with this um so i would have i would have wanted it broken apart let's deal with the sidewalks sb sb 946 as a complete separate agenda item and then and then not seeing the trucks uh mixed in so, madam clerk madam clerk i would like to change my vote to an i for now thank you okay so recorded uh commissioner takahashi did you uh, are you good with your your yep. no vote? Correct. Okay, Commissioner Fung. So before I before I vote, I, I just want to remind everybody that what we're the way that this is moving forward now, it is with staff rep, staff recommendations on on uh, sidewalk vendors that is independent of the things that are required for compliance with SB nine uh, nine six nine forty six and. With that, I will also vote no. Okay, Commissioner Saxena? Yes. And Chair Moore? Aye. Okay, the motion carries 302 with uh, <clears throat> Takahashi and Fung voting no. That would okay. be 3 2, right? 3 3 2 0, yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, so that concludes item three, and we are moving on to item four. Subject, municipal code amendments to adopt glazing and lighting regulations to implement the fiscal year 2019-2020 city council work program items related to dark sky and bird safe design, application number MCA 2019-003 and MCA-2019-004, applicant, the city of Cupertino, location citywide, continued from the August 11th, 2020 meeting. Recommended action, conduct the public hearing and recommend that the city council find that the action is exempt from CEQA and amend the municipal code by adding a new chapter 19.102 and amending chapters 19.08, 19.12, 19.40, 19.60, and 19.72 to adopt glazing and lighting regulations to implement bird safe design and dark sky goals. Tentative city council hearing date, December 1st, 2020. And we begin with a staff report. Good evening. So I'll start off with the presentation, Chair Moore. Okay, so I just want to briefly um, catch everyone up. Uh, we did a study session and outreach um, back in 2019 and outreach in 2020. We recently brought it to Planning Commission uh, for everyone to hear on August 11th. And so this is our second hearing at Planning Commission was continued. Uh, we took in comments from our last public hearing and we have specifically addressed those concerns from um, the commission. I'm gonna go over the bird safe and then uh, Eric will join in with uh, the dark sky regulations. 
So some of the concerns uh, that was brought up and the changes that we made uh, were in reference to bird safe glazing, um, bird safe treatment area and possible exemptions. We also addressed uh, bird safe interior lighting requirements and uh, did some clarification within the design requirement section of the draft ordinance. So for the bird safe proposed applicability, nothing's really changed here. Um, if you look at the red line document, but I just wanted to highlight what areas would be applicable. Uh, so new primary or accessory buildings, remodel of primary or accessory buildings only to the remodeled portions, and then uh, newer replacement glass of uh, windows, doors, and features. So it, essentially, if you're building any new buildings or if you're doing a remodel of any portions, we'd want you to be compliant with bird safe design. Okay, and then the, one of the concerns that the commissioners brought were the cost. And so um, what we did was we talked to a couple of manufacturing of bird safe treatments. So I'm highlighting two specific types. Uh, and in the rest of my presentation, I will go over some of the other options. There are many, many options. Um, but the two that are pretty common for bird safe glazing treatments is fritting and UV. So generally the average cost of an untreated glazing, so like a curtain wall, imagine an office building with floor to, to ceiling windows and doors. Um, typically that costs about 100 to 200 square feet for a curtain wall and that's untreated glazing. And so if you're gonna do added fritting or added UV, that's uh, cost about five, um, $5 per square feet for fritting and for UV, 12 to 15 square feet. Again, these are just two companies that we reached out to, and there's a lot of different um, costs associated with uh, just window installation because you have to pick your glazing, you have to pick your framing, uh, and, and then, you know, your shipping and all of that. Um, but overall for fritting, it's just an added, you know, 5% cost and for UV about 10% of window cost. And so I, I'm trying to present this in, um, these are all estimated numbers. So uh, if at the bottom chart, you'll see we highlight the typical type of homes, because I know that was the major concern of commissioners was the cost to a typical homeowner. So we did evaluation on a single story home, a two story home and a two story hillside home. Um, and we base it off of the approximate square footage of the home, uh, the total number of windows that home had. So we used uh, kind of projects that came into the city and we used kind of an estimate of what that would be. And then we found out the applicable window square footage um, for each of those three types. Um, so the bottom portion is kind of the, the main data points. And then if you look at the, the table on top, this is the math that we used based off of the estimates that were given to us from the two companies. So an average cost of untreated glazing, that's the second column on the top chart. Uh, if we're going for, um, you know, between 100 to 200 square feet for unglazed curtain wall, uh, we used an estimate of the average of 150 square feet based off of the applicable windows. That's the approximate cost. Uh, again, this is not um, concrete numbers. Okay, these are just comparison to if you were to do the treatment to windows that would be untreated. Um, so Added cost for fritting, um, you can see for a single story home, um, about 3,000 square, uh, $3,000. And then for UV rating, um, maybe about $6,000. In the revised ordinance, we uh, removed the minimum window sizes requirement and typical to what other cities have done, they've simply just applied a um, allowance that said that you can have uh, you'd have to treat 90% of the glazing on a frontage and then 10% could be untreated. So you can um, elect to choose your, 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 your areas. Uh, if you look at the image to the left of the slide, uh, you know, the blue will represent windows and the white would represent solid facades or ones that are not glazing. And so for glass between the ground and 60 feet above, uh, if you look at the at the side that's kind of facing us with more white, that one uh, you can see already 10% of that facade is, um, uh, 
90% of that facade is already treated as in it's not glazing, right? So the glazing requirement would be based off of the facade. Um, just to clarify, we didn't make any changes to the 10% and the 5%. That's our, that was already in our original draft. We just removed the minimum window size. To address uh, some concerns about affordable housing and just the impact to single family homes, we clarified that there would be exemptions. The two that we've listed are residential developments in R1 zones that are not in bird sensitive areas uh, would be exempted and also 100% affordable housing projects. So bird sensitive areas is defined as um, areas that are residential hillside uh, within 300 feet of parks and open space within our wildland, 300 feet or within our wildland urban interface. So those areas we've kind of targeted as attractants to birds. If you are a single family development in an R1 zone that's outside of those areas, bird sensitive areas, you would be exempted from these requirements. So I just um, wanted to bring back some of the images of how um, someone can treat uh, their, their glazing. Again, this is mainly, we get a lot of bird strikes typically from ground floor up. So it's not the skyscrapers. And so in the city of Cupertino, we do have smaller, um, we have lower heights, but that would bird, um, bird collision does happen on the lower floors as well. Some of these treatments you can see, they can do dots, you can do different designs and they can integrate well with the building and the offices. Um, so these are just a couple of images of other bird safe treatments. The intent of the bird safe glazing requirement is to first minimize glazing. If a property owner decides to build with um, glass as their main material, this is when this would kick in because then now you have to um, be cautious that the windows, that the transparency of the glazing um, will attract birds and they won't see that it's a solid frontage. And so you can do that with some of the, um, you know, fritting or UV that I showed in previous pictures or something like on this last one, the bottom right, you can have exterior, um, uh, you know, projections like, you know, this, this very artistic articulated facade um, in front of your glazing as well. And so from the human's perspective, you can still see out and the birds can visually see that they can't fly straight through the glazing. And then for interior lighting, there was concern from commissioners saying that it was, it was gonna be difficult to enforce if someone kept their lights on during off during a certain time. And so we have um, only, we have um, made it only applicable to non-residential. Uh, so this will apply to you know, our office building. So if they're not using the space, um, so they would have to turn off their lights. Um, the requirements specifically in the ordinance states that they would have to install time switch or automatic occupancy sensors. This is already pretty typical of um, you know, non-residential properties. Uh, and then the lights off requirement would be 11 p.m. or two hours after the close of business. And we've removed blinds as an option that's kind of more behavioral and it's a little more difficult to manage. And so to address the planning commissioner's um, concerns about lighting in residential, uh, we've just removed it completely um, for residential properties. And then lastly, we did a clarification on design. This wasn't really a concern from commissioners, but we want to just clarify that um, uh, features that are visible from end to end, uh, like this glass hallway example, should also be avoided. So the way the draft ordinance was written was um, we should avoid uh, tight corners where uh, or um, reflective glass. And we just wanted to clarify that uh, even though, um, even if uh, you have this hallway like this, a bird can see through to both sides and kind of fly right through um, and, and, and collide into the class. So we just added a clarification that um, visible uh, features that are visible from end to end should also be avoided. 
So that covers the bird safe requirements and the modifications that we made to the last draft ordinance based off of your comments and some clarifications. Um, we do have the lighting portion as well. We can continue with the presentation so you get all of staff's input um, or we can stop for questions. Uh, do the commissioners have a preference? Uh, do you have some burning questions that you want to get answered right now? I'm going to switch to gallery view. How are we doing? Any questions? Well, let, let me ask one. It's actually a lighting question, which was in your fir the first half of your presentation there about timers and, uh, and lighting. I just wanted to clarify. For, so, for instance, for a building like Apple Park, are they compliant with that law now? I'm still unmuted. Um, I don't. I don't know the answer to that specifically. Um, mm -hmm. They probably had a. They did go through a bird review as part of their EIR, but specifically for interior lighting, um, I can't say that I know specifically if they are in compliance. But I don't think we've had any code complaints about bright lights. Um, I can try to answer that if I may, uh, Hugo Planning Manager. If they are compliant, that's because they have voluntarily complied with it, but there are no necessary requirements or regulations from the city's end with regard to that. Right. So I, I'm just actually asking that question, posing it more as a, if somebody were to build a building like that after this law, whether that, that, that um, when you drive by Apple Park at night, it does, it is lit, although not as lit as when, you know, it would be if you were driving by, you know, early in the evening or, or during the day. So they, I don't, I don't have, I have no doubt that they're doing things like occupancy sensors and trying to reduce the amount of light. But at the same time, there is a lot of glass and, uh, uh, and there is some amount of lighting. Um, and I realize that this doesn't apply retroactively. So uh, I, I'm just curious about the implications of that, um, of that particular wording for the future. <clears throat> if I may, um, so one of the things that the energy code does require or starting to require is that lighting be on motion sensors. So at a certain point in time, um, lighting is meant to be turned off, um, essentially when it's not in use. So that's something I can't recall for retroactively that goes back, but um, in discussions with um, some of the, our, our building engineers, um, they mentioned that's something that's occurring more and more. Um, as a, a requirement to meet the Title 24 energy uh, requirements. Thanks. Get myself. I have a quick question for Ellen. So the the window treatments are now in for what what elevations? What height? Yeah. So uh, it's on all facades and all elevations. The difference is um, zero to 60 and then 60 and above. Okay, so from zero from ground to 60 feet above ground, uh, you have to treat 90% of the glazing on that facade. Okay. And then for 60 feet above, that is 95% uh, of glazing needs to be treated. Okay, and I thought I had read that there was a, an exception for zero to 15 feet in commercial areas. Correct, yeah. So that exemption still stands from the previous draft ordinance, which I didn't specify because it wasn't modified. But yes, in exemption, we do have up to a height of 15 feet for first floor um, commercial storefronts. Okay, so if I were if I were to build a, a, um, a tower that's uh, 200 feet tall, uh, the first, and I have some commercial on the ground floor, 50, it's 15 feet, there would be no, no requirement there. And then I've got a 90% requirement then really from 15 to 60 feet, and then a 95% requirement over 60 feet and up to the 200. You okay. got it. Got it. Okay, good. Um, any other commissioners? Okay, so we'll move on to the um, dark skies ordinance, right? Sounds good. Okay, let's make this. 
All right, everyone see my screen okay? Okay. All right, so, uh, so as Ella mentioned, this is a continuation from the Planning Commission uh, meeting. So there are some questions and, and some stuff that uh, Steph needed to go back and look into. So one of the things that we looked at was the cost analysis of light fixtures. So we, we looked at different light fixtures um, and, and how they would be implemented. And to be honest, the cost is minimal, especially for, um, for residential projects. Um, Lighting could even exist in line, could be retrofitted with either photocells or motion sensors. You could just buy a, um, like a small attachment that can be um, wired into an existing light fixtures will range between 10 and $30. Um, new lighting with photocells, um, so you know, dark, even when it gets dark, those lights um, range between 10 and 200. Um, you can even buy photos lighting with photocells and motion sensors. And those range between thirty-five dollars and one hundred fifty. Really depends on how much you want to spend, but the the price range is pretty significant um, in, in that. And so we also looked at the residential, non-residential. So our regulations as proposed uh, would apply citywide, and this is generally consistent with uh, other cities who have dark sky ordinances. Um, the the cost prohibitive elements like a like a photometric plant, or you need an electrical engineer or light engineer. Um, we did a, uh, uh, include a provision that the, the CDD director, the community development director, uh, can waive certain requirements when when can waive certain requirements when the compliance can be determined. So we didn't make any changes um, there. We just made a clarification on the, on the beginning of the, of the dark sky ordinance. In terms of code enforcement, um, so pro processes already exist in the municipal code to, to deal with code enforcement, code enforcement and violations. So we work a lot, um, you know, staff it, it does work as a rec re reactive code enforcement. Um, and our goal is always to achieve compliance. So the benefit of using the new proposed regulations is that we would have very clear objective standards to help ensure compliance. And so we didn't make any changes for um, anything code enforcement related. So in, in implementation of other cities, uh, I was able to speak to the city of San Spisal and Portola Valley. Um, they have pretty stringent um, dark sky ordinance. And, and in discussions with them, um, the ordinance implementation was not difficult. Um, you know, it, it seemed from their experience that the applicants and residents were able to understand the ordinance relatively quickly. Um, enforcement was was smooth when they could point to objective standards. So motion sensors, photo cells, orientation, fixture type, that kind of stuff made it really easy for them to be like, oh yes, this is a violation. Um, and they were it would be able to handle that. So we, we did discuss with um, some chamber members regarding um, the, the regulations and, and generally they're, they're pretty supportive. Um, when you, with our larger developments, um, the parking regulations really kick in and our parking regulations have a lot of lighting regulations. And those lighting regulations are actually already, are, are transferred into this proposed ordinance. Um, so many of the regulations like dark, no direct offsite glare, the parking light levels, and then allowing for higher levels of illumination in certain areas, that's that's already built in. So many of our um, newer developments are already in, in incorporating that into their projects. Um, one concern that they did have was, um, well, not concerned, but the thought was, you know, coordinating lighting and late night activities. Um, so we did update the ordinance to propose that outdoor lighting um, can be allowed to go past 11 p.m. in conjunction with a use permit. So we chose a use permit um, because that's the, the the tool that people need to be able to go to go past 11. So if you go past 11 um, in the commercial business, you do need a use permit um, for that. Uh, one item the the commission did bring up was lighting at sports fields and in parks. So. Um, the city does not have any regulatory authority over lighting at public schools. Um, or, um, so the, pro the proposed ordinance does exempt lighting within the public right of way and parks. So new lighting at public sports courts, fields, and, and parks would, would, be, would be reviewed in conjunction with the capital improvement program. So it would go through the normal um, process through, through council um, for that. High intensity discharge lighting would be prohibited at any private sports court and then any private lighting for a sports court would be reviewed with consistency with, with the regulation. Um, so public comments uh, at the hearing. So those are concerned with the new regulatory requirements during the, you know, the current economic situation. Um, it should be noted that many of these regulatory um, requirements are already applicable in, in a lot of commercial mixed use um, areas and multifamily areas and, and, and to an extent hillside zones. 
Um, the ordinance really serves as a consolidation and expansion of the, the lighting requirements to all zones. Um, one big thing to note too is that we're, we're not um, retroactively applying these. These are um, allowing for con existing non-conforming lighting fixtures to continue. They essentially, um, the or your lighting can remain until you know a certain threshold is hit. You know, a new development or replacing a fixture. Um, so we we didn't we didn't want to mess with that and want to allow people to kind of transition uh, a little bit uh, smoother. So uh, this is a table kind of showing um, how the outdoor lighting requirements exist and, and are proposed. So you'll see, you know, commercial mixed use, multifamily and, and larger housing elements already have some of these lighting requirements um, that apply to them. The, the big difference now is single family duplex and triplex will also have these um, proposed with them. Uh, this slide is a just a, some some of the changes um, since the first draft. Act. Um, so reduce the applicability of the first safe treatment, uh, eliminated the interior lighting stands for all residential developments, um, exempted 100% of affordable housing developments and single family development outside bird sensitive areas, allowed an alternative standards for public art. Essentially, if you are, for instance, doing um, lighting art uh, kind of thing, like think the Bay Bridge, um, that artwork would be reviewed in conjunction with an art permit, um, which would go through the Fine Arts Commission. Um, and then we also clarified the language regarding lighting associated with permitted late night activity. Um, so these are all the applicable um, CEQA exemptions for the ordinance. So 15308 um, being adopted to ensure maintenance, restoration, enhancement, or protection of the environment. Section 15301, uh, regulations would not result in the expansion of use. 15305, minor alteration in land use alteration that does, that does not alter permitted uses or density. 15061B3 is it can be seen with certainty that the proposed regulation will have no possible significant effect on the environment. And the section, section 15300.2, the, 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 the project, the CEQA exemption applies to the proposed ordinance. So, um, so, so for public noticing, um, did our, our you know, normal noticing for a hearing, so legal ad in the newspaper, at least 10 days prior to the hearing, or display ad in the newspaper, post on the city's official notice for this bulletin board, and post on the city's website um, four days prior to the hearing. Um, so our recommended action is to conduct a public hearing and adopt the draft resolution recommending the council find the actions exempt from CEQA and amend municipal code by adding a new chapter 19102, <clears throat> chapters 1908, 19.12, 19.40, 19.60, and 19.72 to about placing and lighting regulations to implement bird safe design and dark sky goals. And that concludes my portion and uh, staff is available for any questions. Do any of the commissioners have some questions on <coughs> this portion, the dark skies portion. Okay, uh, well, I have one one question. If I if I had, which I don't, if I had a, uh, I was installing an outdoor tennis court on my, on my estate, <laughs> but I don't have, if I'm doing that and I want to play tennis at 10 o'clock at night, it's hot, it's cooled off, I want to play tennis, it's late, would I be able to put uh, lights out there? It sounds like I can't. You can't put high intensity discharge lighting. So, you know, you know, it'd be kind of more of a glow than anything. Um, you'd have to meet all our other requirements, you know, shielded. Uh, for that one, we will likely want a photometric plan. Um, to ensure that the, the, the light is being dispersed evenly and not too bright. Um, and we wouldn't want it to be glaring to any of your, your neighbors. You know, even, even if you're on the state, someone could probably see your light. And so we want to make sure that that's not being intrusive and the lighting is, you know, being directed towards the appropriate use. Um, and, and, and really the intent is to, you know, help with the dark sky. Okay. So was that... <laughs> Not sure that was so, a no. <laughs> so it's it's it depends on how bright you want it. So like, I, I I will say, uh, uh, Chair Moore, it depends on the activity, right? You're talking about tennis. Uh, depends on your eyesight and, and depends on what level of uh, lighting you desire for your tennis court. If you're looking at sort of the recreational, you know, technical tennis courts, then you obviously need a higher intensity intensity type of lights, and then that would not wouldn't be per, uh, permitted. 
but uh, if it's just for family use and recreational for your family and you want to use a lower intensity type of lighting that, that, that fits the requirement, then you can certainly do that. So it's a yes and no uh, okay. response. Okay. So that, and that's the only, that's the only private use I could think of that would require that much, that much lighting outdoors. Oh, I would do that, that in basketball. Yeah. I mean, uh, outdoor court, but you might want to have outside floodlights as well. Right. You, you have a barbecue or party outside your house, but let's say we're in so, safer environments. Uh, you might be running 50 watt uh, LED lights in the back so people can see. So, we so do, those would be banned. We do, yeah, we do prohibit that. Um, but the big thing to remember is that the, the, the really the intent is so that lighting is not being directed to uh, uh, you know, adjacent properties away from the use. Right. So if you have an out, sort of outside patio or a barbecue, um, there's really no intent to be, you know, pointing the light away from you, right? The light should be um, to kind of, well, that's the intent at least. Is this, um, are we grandfathered in for existing client, existing single family in this, in this uh, proposal? Yeah. Correct. So we're not asking for any retroactive lights to be, um, you know, updated, upgraded. What we do ask is if a lighting of a fixture is being replaced, or a new fixture is proposed, that that fixture would be consistent with the dark sky lighting requirements. Uh, a related question to tennis courts. So if the city owned tennis courts, mm -hmm. uh, if some uh, maintenance needs to be done, mm -hmm. uh, will the cost of the city go up now to be compliant with the new thing? No, we we did we uh, purposely exempted lighting within the public right away and a public park so that that lighting uh, would not be uh, impacted by this. Okay, thanks. Okay, and there's so if you're replacing your lights, you do need to comply. So the, uh, I should be more specific. Light lighting fixtures. So if your light bulb goes out, we're not going to say go get a whole new thing. It's your lighting fixture. So if you're going from you know what a different design essentially that's when it would get triggered um, like oh my light bulb went out i got to go buy a new light fixture that's not our intent our intent is for that fixture to whenever you choose to replace that fixture that fixture is updated. okay okay are there any further questions from the commissioners before i open this up for public comment Okay, not hearing any. I'm going to go for opening up public comment and our first individual is Connie Cunningham. Connie? Oh, good evening, Chair Moore. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Welcome, Connie. You have three minutes. Okay, uh, good evening, Chair Moore and Planning Commissioners. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. I did send two photos uh, that I would like shared on the screen at this time. Um, is that possible? Okay, that that first little bird is a um, ruby crowned kinglet. And the next one down, Beth, when you show that one is a hooded oriole. Um, I am Connie Cunningham. I've lived here for 33 years and I'm a Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society member. I commend staff for an excellent report responding to the Planning Commission's questions from August the 11th. These recommendations will be effective in reducing harmful effects of glass and lighting. I am writing to support the city's implementation of dark sky and bird safe design municipal ordinances. These changes will not only protect the birds in our city that bring joy and life to residents, but will also protect all humans since light pollution is detrimental to us as well as wildlife. I have over 35 photos of wild birds who live in my neighborhood that live and raise their families among us. Some live here year round, some migrate with the seasons. As a resident who enjoys birds and bird watching, I share with many residents the desire to protect wild birds since they cannot protect themselves from human impacts. Why I care. Hundreds of thousands of migratory birds collide with windows every year, including cedar waxwings, 
American Robins, Yellow Rumped Warblers, Crowned Sparrows, and Ruby Crowned Kinglets. These are all birds you can see in my neighborhood. During the early month of the COVID pandemic, I posted a different wild, wild bird species each day to next door. And many, many people responded with stories of their own about the wild birds in their yards. Having these birds living near us and sharing, and sharing our sightings amongst ourselves benefited all of us. Why I care about light pollution? It gets worse every year. It affects the biology and health of humans as well as all living things. For birds, this also interferes with migration. They are distracted by artificial light from their natural flight patterns. Other birds that migrate to my neighborhood are the black-crowned grosbeak and the hooded oriole. I urge you to support Cupertino environment and birds by taking the actions recommended by the staff report. One, find that the action is exempt from CEQA, and two, to amend the municipal code as specified in the report. Thank you so much for this time to speak on behalf of those who cannot speak for themselves. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Connie. And to move the screen. And next we have Dashiell Leeds. Dashiell, welcome. Cool. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Dashiell Leeds. I'm the conservation assistant for the Sierra Club Loma Prieta chapter. Uh, our chapter is in strong support of the ordinance tonight. Um, I'd really like to second Connie's comments. Um, there's something really magical about watching birds, even photos of birds, but especially in real life, there's something calming and peaceful about it. And I think having a healthy ecosystem around us uh, is really a benefit uh, to our mental health, not to mention um, the fact that nature should be protected for its own right. Um, I'd really like to commend staff on a wonderful presentation and a great ordinance. I think they did a great job at responding to the Planning Commission feedback from the last meeting. Uh, and I hope you can pass this ordinance swiftly. And I guess I'll just end my comments with, um, I, I think it's really a wonderful thing to be able to look up into the night sky, into the night sky and see the clear stars. I think that's a really um, wonderful thing. And uh, I hope that in the future, we, we can move towards a world where people do have a clear view of the night sky and access to a healthy natural world around them. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dashiell. And next we have Rose, Rose Grimes. Rose, are you there? I am. Okay, so thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity, Chair Moore. And I'm going to endorse uh, what Dashiell and Connie have said much more poetically than, than I could. So since it's late, I won't repeat them, but I, I really enjoyed their comments and I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And I'll emphasize not only that I encourage the commission to pass the staff recommendations, but also that as, as Dashiell alluded to, the whole process has been um, really educational. And I think that both the commission and the staff have dealt with this in a, in a very professional and thoughtful way. I think the staff did a great job early on, and this is months and months ago, so I don't want us to lose, lose our memory of that, uh, with community outreach, uh, collecting the inputs from the community, and the community was very engaged. And then uh, moving that along with their expertise into recommendations. And then the commission had a lot of very detailed comments and, and considerations of various scenarios that could affect residents and, uh, and businesses. Um, more than certainly I expected in the first presentation, but uh, again, I think that staff did a great job in um, evaluating those and coming back with the kind of information that the commission was asking for, the commission needed to understand what the impact of this was gonna be on the community. And I think what we've got now in hand is uh, a very sensible tool for achieving the, the ends that were the objective all along. So it being late, I'll, I'll yield the remainder of my time and encourage the commission to endorse the staff recommendation. Thank you. All right, thank you, Rose. And next we have Shawnee, Shawnee Kleinhaus. Shawnee? Welcome, Shawnee. Good evening, Chair Moore. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm Shani Kleinhaus with Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. 
Our organization works to promote the enjoyment, understanding, and protection of birds and other wildlife by engaging people of all ages in birding education and conservation. We're located at McClellan Ranch and have been part of the Cupertino community for two decades. I have personally participated as stakeholder in Cupertino's park master planning process and many other uh, projects and processes over the years. Uh, our Cupertino members, as you've heard, are, they love Cupertino for its environment and specifically for the birds, the trees, the creeks, the parks, and the beauty. And I thank Connie Cunningham and Rose Grimes, Grimes for their comments and Dash too. They spoke so well that they stole a lot of what I wanted to say. So I'll just talk about my experience with buildings that are designed to be safe for birds. Um, and aesthetically, I find that there are a lot of different designs and some of them are rather lovely. Uh, if anybody is interested one day to see a tour of bird safe design buildings, I can take them to Google and Intuit and Facebook and Microsoft and Mercedes-Benz project in Palo Alto, Mid Peninsula open space, their new building and others. And we see that these buildings are also, all of them are now having motion sensors and other controls to restrict lighting due to Title 24 energy saving requirements. So Eric and Ellen did a great job. They did really prepared strong and feasible recommendations to protect the night sky, to protect birds and to protect and to help people enjoy them and be protected from light pollution. And we hope that you support staff recommendations and move them forward to city council. Thank you. All right, thank you, Shawnee. And I'm seeing no further hands raised. Um, Madam Clerk, did we receive any communications for this item? Uh, we haven't received any during uh, the presentation or oral communications at this time. Earlier today and yesterday, I did forward some written communications emails that came in and uh, those will be attached and added to the packet as part of the public record tomorrow. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, we are on to our deliberations. If anyone wanted to make a motion, we could put, set that forth and then deliberate on it, or we can just simply start asking some more questions and however we want to do this. I'd be happy to make a motion on this. Um, I basically will uh, read the material from the draft resolution uh, that we find the ordinance is exempt from environmental review under the CEQA guidelines uh, section 15308. Uh, I don't think I need to say all of this. Uh, well, per the per the uh, draft resolution. Uh, second, that we adopt the proposed ordinance with the findings reflected in the proposed ordinance, which the Planning Commission makes as though as, as though set forth in their entirety in this resolution, uh, in substantial the form shown in the exhibit uh, attached. I second. And do we want to have some discussion on this? I'd like to thank the staff. Uh, we, 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 had, we had much more input for you than I thought we were going to have in the first hearing. Uh, and actually, I think you really did a fantastic job of responding uh, to those items. Uh, I think there one, one item, uh, Commissioner Wong actually pointed out something that there was, um, this is this in effect a change to the way that you know that you could have decorative lighting on your home uh, in my neighborhood um, on Waterford there's one house that's unlike all the others it's it's you know uh, a house that was rebuilt to be in a very modern style and one of the features it has is a number of kind of upshooting lights uh, kind of uplit uh, plantings um, they really look fantastic it's really cool I suspect it's probably not going to be something that would be legal in the future but on balance, you know, given the uh, good that will come from this um, ordinance, I think that it's probably uh, an okay trade. Uh, and anyway, so, uh, you know, that I support the uh, uh, the resolution as, as uh, submitted. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I do have a, a clarifying question and it's regards to some of the lighting, which we see out at Main Street on the, on the trees, there's lighting there. And then there's a, uh, a kind of a wall 
of of light. I don't know how to, how to better to describe it, but it's on the um, the Marriott Residence Inn. And I was wondering if that if uh, I was concerned about the permitted use. So uh, is would that be allowed under the new ordinance? I just want to clarify that both the the trees being lit and say though they're on until midnight um and and would a new structure be able to have a solid wall that's lit if you're if you're familiar with that feature yeah i th i think i know what you're talking about the marriott uh, it's kind of at the corner right it's like a like opaque glass that kind of thing exactly yeah. like maybe there's a lumen a lumens you know some brightness level that that would uh the new ordinance would um affect and then it was, and then also those, the trees. So there is, um, we do have, so for the Marriott, um, there's some lighting, like architectural features. Um, well, for that's more up lighting. It, it could be done if it's more of an art type of thing or, or, or um, up, up lighting that's highlighting an architectural feature. I'm not sure. I don't think our ordinance would allow for that multicolored thing unless it went through some sort of, um, process you know if they were to say oh marriott this is this is a art installation it's going to do different colors and, or something like that and potentially that way um in terms of the trees our ordinance would not allow for that at the moment it's exposed lighting um it's not pointing to a particular use um yeah i don't think <laughs> Um, silly, question, silly question then um, we have a um, holiday we have a holiday tree that we put up each year mm -hmm. um That'd be okay. That's um, holiday seasonal lighting. Okay, just just to clarify that. Okay, <laughs> but, but but at Main Street, it it seemed like it was holiday seasonal, but then it extended to oh, all that, year round. That, yeah, holiday that's never I, ended. Yeah, that that's the tricky part, right? It's it, holiday lighting is exempt, and um, my oh there it is. Okay, my PDF is acting weird. So we did have holiday lighting um, during the period of October fifteenth through January fifteenth. We we gave it a big sway because it's kind of holiday season in in, in Cupertino. Um, so that lighting would be exempt. But if it keeps going, right, um, then it's not really holiday lighting at a certain point. Hmm. So is it is it grandfathered in? I would have to check on that. I, okay. I can't, I, I'd have to see if the, what the permit history on the site. I'm not sure if there's anything that they got. Um, any permits or anything like that. I, I, I don't know at the moment. I, I, I have to check. Okay, so I'm just, I'm sort of curious if there's like a dimmer version that would be acceptable, anything like that, because I, I, I think it's uh, attractive how they did it, um, but it is also really bright. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, I, I have to double check if it would be grandfathered in, um, but as proposed, unless, unless it was up during the holidays, it wouldn't be allowed. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So we do have a motion in a second and we are deliberating. Um, do any of the other commissioners have some comments or questions? Yeah. I just wanted to thank the staff for uh, going and getting that data about the costs. And I think it's very reassuring to get those numbers uh, because um, we now recognize uh, the value and the cost trade off. It almost becomes a no brainer. And I know, at least from my perspective, I think that's a useful principle to have that whenever we're adding more regulation, we have some estimate of what it would take translate to in terms of the burden. Um, I think very often, especially in California, we. Uh, we add regulation, uh, I'm not talking about the planning commission, but the under the state, and the consequences of that are probably not thought through. Uh, so I would encourage the city to always have that thing in mind and uh, keep that as a part of your process of developing new, uh, bringing new items here. Thank you. All for me. I can go next. Okay, Commissioner Takahashi. Yeah, um, I agree. I think um, took all the feedback, definitely clearly answered all of the questions that we raised, um, got a flavor for the concerns that we brought up, um, you know, affordable housing, for example. 
um, in terms of where exemptions were um, changed. And so, um, yeah, I think great job and um, looking forward to approving this. That's all I have. Okay, thank you. And uh, Vice Chair Wong. Yeah, I'm. I think I like the work that was done on the um, on the glazing and the uh, bird safe aspect of it. Um, I think I'm still opposed to the dark skies piece. And so, if it was up to me, I would break the two up, and I would be happy to pass and support folks on the uh, on the uh, bird safe portion. The dark skies piece, I think, is a little bit of uh, over regulation to me. So. Uh, but that's where I stand. So if there's a, if somebody's happy to split them up, I'm happy to support it. So. Okay. Um, so thank you, Vice Chair Wong. Uh, I, I have a, a question going back to the, um, the, the trees that are lit at, at Main Street. So uh, if, if a person had um, like string lighting in their, in their courtyard uh, and they want to have that lighting on all year round, I'm, I'm gathering that they wouldn't be allowed to do that. Is that correct? They would only be allowed to have it during this designated um, holiday season. Is that my understanding that right? So it wouldn't just be Main Street, it could be uh, residential locations. Right, uh, the, way, the way it's ran right now, it's exposed light bulbs um, is, is uh, the big thing, exposed light bulbs. Okay. And it doesn't matter if that light bulb is a little tiny, um, you know, a, a, a small... We didn't draw that distinction um, in, in the ordinance. Okay. I would be I would be more inclined to support it if it didn't cover single family homes. That's where I draw the line. So just to give you an idea. Oh, well, okay. So um, Vice Chair, do you, are you, what do you think of the trees that are lit at Main Street? all year round um see to me it's i think that's a decorative proposal on their end right but it wouldn't qualify like if you were to build a new community they wouldn't be able to do that given these laws right could, it be considered so, art? could you call it art and and you could try to classify it as art uh and, and say that's that's part of the decor and the aura that they're trying to provide in a design level i mean You, you just cut out. Okay, so Vice Chair Wong just, just cut out. Um, so is there a way that we can consider that um, art, uh, the, the tree lighting? Is there, and, and could a, could a residence also say, you know, this this is for artistic reasons? Is that at all possible or no? No, it, it's, I mean, the, the intent of having that, that lighting for art is that it does have some review to it. So it's not just anybody can go like, oh, look, it's art, right? Um, the idea is that if you're proposing lighting for art or lighting that is art, that it is reviewed by some by by the fine arts commission that it would go through the, their process and so that there would be some discretionary input from them okay is there a way that that this could be defined um as as string lighting and we, we can definitely look into that um i haven't seen string lighting and, and it, you know it, it kind of there's a balance right um like how much is too much um but that's definitely something that we can look into and, and we can um give give direction on that and bring that to the council if, if it moves forward we can tell them you know the concerns from the planning commission and um we can look into how other cities have done it i i, I can't recall again specifically seeing um street lights um, most cities do prohibit that okay so that i mean that gets into what uh, uh vice chair wong was saying about over regulation and to me it feels like over regulation because you know i know that there are, are people in my own neighborhood that have string lighting out year round um, and could you repeat when the holiday season is con is considered yeah it's from october 15th through january 15th okay so oh yeah. well, there are some other holidays which people might want exactly you know because um 
I know the Indian Diwali sometimes can be in October and the season starts like two or three weeks before that. So, okay. like, uh, we probably want to have the entire Q4 or something like that. <clears throat> Right, and when then my concern is that when you're defining the holiday season, it's it's um, that it it seems like it's considering certain holidays, and we I don't think we want to go there. Um, it seems in, inappropriate. Mm -hmm. it, it, again, it's it's a it's a it's a balance. Um, I, I can't recall specifically what jurisdiction. Uh, did incorporate holiday lighting. There was um, okay. I'm trying to pull up the comparison chart. Um, I think I think with with holiday lighting, we want to have some sort of definition of what what holiday lighting is, um, and does that mean string lights um, or not? So yeah, if, I think personally, I'd want some way to get the the string lights out, okay. perhaps out of this ordinance. Um, okay. Or you know, or, or or any suggestions from the other commissioners on how to deal with deal with that, uh, or if some opinions, if you're finding it to be too much regulation, or are you in in the same mind as uh, the vice chair, and you would like to just simply um, go ahead with the bird safe design and not do the um, dark sky. If I may suggest one thing, uh, Chair Moore. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, please. Uh, maybe the commission can give us a little bit of direction in terms of, you know, what you would like to see, and we can do a little bit of research in terms of what other communities do with regard to string lights, and we can incorporate that into the city council action, um, so that at least we can um, bring that to the council and, and take your concerns to them. Okay, so so personally, I like the string lighting. Uh, my concern is that in the in Main Street that the they've got a lot of it. So it is, it is pretty bright and it's hard to tell if the brightness is from, from those trees or is it just a general brightness of the, the area being, being lit up. So I, I can't really, you know, make that personal determination, but I like them. I think they're attractive and I know that people enjoy having them in their, in their courtyards so that they can sit out in the evenings when it's nice. So I wouldn't want to limit that. And I think um, I'm not personally seeing uh, a, a at residences, a level of brightness, which is, is you know, overwhelming. Um, so that would be the, the area I'd want to see looked into. We, we can certainly bring some, we take some language forward to council once you make your recommendation. We, we, we can also maybe suggest a language could be a definition for holiday lighting, something like, you know, festive low output lamps or, you know, limited to a small individual bulbs on a string or, you know, low output lamps used for to internally illuminate uh, yards or art or something like that uh, as a suggestion for a definition. Okay. I, I, I believe you, you do have a motion in a second. You could have multiple vote motions if, if you want to go in that route uh, to split the items as well. Okay. So missed the split. Oh. What was the split? Um, or we could do a, add a friendly amendment, um, but I, I would need some help with the language of that. I'm not crazy about about making an amendment. Actually, I think that uh, uh, well, I, I I hear the uh, I hear the concerns. Uh, I think that uh, well. Well, right now, I think, the, I right now, will have to turn off their lights in uh, January. The the tree lights. Yeah. What's this? This was ret retroactive. Yeah. These requirements are all retroactive. Mm -hmm. no. So will Main not. Street have to turn theirs off in January or will they, will they be able to ignore the it depends on, on their on their whether that was part of their approval, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, I think that's what we would want to look at. Um yeah. you said lighting it that much would probably have some sort of review, just the output. Um but we'd have to I, I, I can't speak to that specifically as to if or what permit they, they uh, received. Right. Could be an assessment of the wattage or the lumens that they're utilizing. So I, I guess that from my perspective on the string lighting, um, I, I, we could incorporate a friendly amendment that assesses that. 
but we would want to, to um, understand the impact on the dark skies in general. Um, seems to me to, that that's the whole point <laughs> of what we're trying to accomplish with this, right? So saying that <clears throat> we want to exempt string lighting if there is some fact-based evidence that string lighting is a problem for dark skies, then, you know, we, then, then we're kind of contradicting um, the intent of what we're trying to do. So um, I'm not sure if that's something staff can, can assess and understand. And if, if it is determined that string lighting under a certain um, wattage or uh, lumens is, is not an issue for dark sky, then we just write something along the lines of, um, patio lighting, string lighting, patio line lighting of, because most of the times it is softer than, than your, um, flood lighting for a patio. Um, so. Yeah. We, we can definitely look, definite look into that, um, to see if there is like a threshold for, for yeah. string lighting. I think okay. that's, that's something we can look into for sure. Yeah. I think, I think there's also a time element to that as well. You know, the, the interesting question is if somebody chooses to light their backyard every night of the year, that, that is different also than if they chose to do it, you know, they chose to do it, you know, 10 days out of the year. So yeah, but they would, yeah. they would never be able to install those lights to do that given the way it's, this is written. Yeah. Right. That's, that's part of the problem. It's, it's, it's highly restrictive. I'm 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 happy to if it's okay to split split take out the uh, dark sky provisions and get this part passed on the bird safe and then if we want to go back and reevaluate what you want to do with dark sky um, I mean I I'd be supportive of something that's not residential and um, and if you want to do it on commercial going forward that's fine I mean we're not yeah, building but, a lot of new residential here you know so yeah I don't know if we want to just take residential out because that would essentially allow somebody to really light up their place right which i think is part of what we're trying to accomplish so it's it's some limit it's some element of um what is enough lighting that a, an individual achieves their objective in terms of decorative elements without um lighting up the sky <laughs> Yeah. Well, no one's going to put up a Luxor, right? You know, so. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, the FAA wouldn't allow it, right? I mean, there's no way, yeah. So. Is there a way that we can allow string lighting and have it be at the discretion of the um, community development director? <laughs> we do. We're going to get a mass automated application <laughs> process. Yeah, I mean, that, the, the question then is, what is, what is, the, what is the criteria for approving that? Right. I because mean, I like it, it's not a, you know. It, it would be easier to do for a larger development uh, because we would, we, we, we could get, we typically get a photometric plan and then we can have them display all that lighting and all that. It would actually probably be easier for them. Um, the harder part would be with like the single family, the duplex, the triplex, um, because it's still the exposed bulbs. Um, but it's something I think we can definitely look into um, um, how we can allow it. Um, I, don't, I can't think of a particular way at the moment, but I think staff can can look in um, into other regulations and talk to other cities that have expi explicitly prohibited it and see what um, what they recommend. I think that's something we can definitely do. So we we can recommend this for uh, for approval, and with with a. a recommendation that they look into um, the string lighting and its impact um, and find out you know if there's if there's a way that they can have it be year-round if they agree if there's i don't know some some regulation yeah. you could put on yeah. it I, I don't even know how to word no, it but, 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 but i say i'm gonna i'm gonna oh sorry go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, look my ring security light would no longer qualify Right, my security floodlights would no longer qualify. Like no, the ones that stop activated. So you okay. But yeah. they're but if I leave motion activated on, you, so you have That's a couple fine. types, right? They're all photovoltaic, right? So they're all set up that way. Um, but they're also, I mean, you can set them up as, I mean, those are your floodlights, right? People use their ring yeah. ring motion activated as floodlights on the way in, right? And and if those are disqualified on safety grounds. Um, I'd be concerned, right? Because they're there for safety reasons. Sometimes people leave them on too for 
I mean, it's stupid. If you leave your light on all the time, people realize you're not home. But some people think that tells, you know, it tells burglars you're home. <laughs> you're not home. I mean, I don't know what they do, right? There's, there's, there's like the psychology behind it. So, so people use those lights or they leave a porch light on just to make sure people think they're home, right? You're taking that away from them. This, this is what's going on here. I mean, and you you see them. You see some HOAs where like they require you to leave the light on. Right. So that's the other flip side. Not that we have an HOA here, though, though sometimes we act like one. But, but the point being is like, you know, that's, you know, that you're required to leave a light on everywhere um, just for, for neighborhood safety. So and so oh. if you go around, I mean, I don't think we have a lot of people who leave their lights on, uh, but there's a good number that, that do like they just leave that night light on on their front porch. OK, just just to clarify that they if someone's just changing the light bulb on their fixture which they have there they are not triggering any any change if they already have an existing security light whether it whether it has a sensor a motion sensor or or the 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 uh, photovoltaic sensor um that only if they were to take that off and put a new one on would it have to comply with this with this ordinance so the, there, there's two things there. So you're right, light bulb change, totally fine. Security lighting, um, that's still allowed. So security lighting um, is a provision that we do have and may be provided when necessary to protect persons and property. Um, when when it's applied, it's meant to be controlled by a programmable motion center, motion sensor, um, except where continuous lighting is required by the building code, still no floodlights. Um, Security lighting intended to illuminate a perimeter, such as a fence line um, area, is permitted so that light still doesn't trespass. And then, um, yeah, so it's still motion activated. You still can have security lights that's not being taken away uh, at all. Okay. Okay. And so I, again, my if I'm not still don't know how to word it, but I, if I could make a friendly amendment, it would be to have a, a city council review the portions which would affect string lighting and potentially come up with uh, some regulation around that, which pr provides more flexibility. Yeah. And is that is that an adequate friendly amendment there that I could ask for a second on? Or does it need to be nailed down more? Um, I'll just chime in here. I mean, uh, that, that uh, you know, just to ask council to to consider that portion is a little vague. It doesn't actually indicate which way the commission's leaning, which I think is the intent of the. the okay, state. so to to allow year round low luminosity string lighting as an amendment to as a change to the ordinance as proposed. Correct. That would be. I, I think that would be a fine amendment if you get a second. Do I have a second? No. Alan. Pardon? I think Alan seconded for yeah, you. Yeah, I seconded. You? Okay, great. Thank you, Alan. Can we pause and make sure Beth understands that for the um, for the resolution? Yeah, I was right. I was writing it down. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and I wrote down the time too, so I can go back and just make sure. I, I say, I mean, I mean, from a process perspective, I'd rather split the vote and and split the two areas between bird safe and dark skies, right? Get the bird safe part done, get it in place, and then the dark skies piece. I'm just, um, that's one of those where it's it's it, the regulatory piece on that to me is, I don't know how to put it. It's we're being very very restrictive. Um, uh, almost too restrictive, um, and, and and I think that's that's the part that concerns me. So, um, so I'm happy to split, and then if you want to add your string amendment, like to string lights and low lights things for exceptions, um, I, I think it'd be easier for me to debate and deliberate that. So, don't we have to? vote on the motion that's at hand well you have to vote the motion off right. you have to vote no on this motion 
right. to if, split or withdraw if, if you were going to go that way. If right. not, you if, could do it all at once here. So, right. And yeah. So, that's, so that's again, we can vote, we can vote on this and see how 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 right if we if we're if a majority of us is in agreement to split, then we'll we would vote it down and then discuss and re um, re motion right to have to, to have them separate. If it passes, then um, I think we're we're done. Right? The, uh, okay, so I, I want to clarify from staff um, looking at the draft resolution. Uh, the the ordinance to add chapter 19.102 glass and lighting standards uh it, it seems to me that dividing this up um is going to be complicated i i would agree that's why i think we should vote. <laughs> well that's that's partly why i'm i'm a little upset that they were combined because it was intentionally pushed through this way so that you'd only had one choice, so that you only make one recommendation to get to council, and and that to me was was not right. So I, that's that's why I'm reacting the way I'm reacting. So to me, they're two separate initiatives that are being rolled in, right? But for expediency's sake, this, you know, and, and it's also like 11:42 at night. Um, I can see I can see exactly what's going on, right? So I, I, that's why that, that's my only point. But you can vote for it and see what happens. And, I, I and that's Alan. Alan's correct on that. So. I disagree with the suggestion that there was there was some old kind of motivation towards putting these items together. I look at it more in terms of, uh, as it was described, uh, we're talking about you know not disturbing wildlife at at night. The, and we're looking at bird health and uh, wanting to take care of the the glazing issues during the the daytime. And then you have the the, the light coming out of the buildings and all the, this, this whole thing, I think it all goes together with, uh, you know, taking care of, of birds. So I, I, I can understand why they put it together um, like that. I, I Right. The other thing I would add is, is, is last time we went through this, I think we, had, we brought up concerns about over restriction. Um, and those were, I thought, addressed by um, the revisions that um, staff made on on this amendment. So, um, I, I I'd actually say that I think that there were some. Let's see, am I, okay, there were some exemptions added here that I think did actually address some of the bigger concerns. Right. Um, I, I look at this. I I completely understand. You know, uh, Ray, I, you brought up this. You brought up your concern in the first hearing. So you know, if there's any if there's any fault, you know. That, that it didn't get split. I mean, that is that is maybe one, um, you know, it's a valid concern. I just look at it, uh, you know, we, we, we wouldn't back up and try to have a discussion around, well, you know, we want to have a bird safe policy, but it doesn't need to be as safe as it was, right? Uh, that, I think that's a little bit of what we're, <laughs> what we're doing here. If we, you know, if we're trying to really say we have a policy that promotes, you know, dark skies, then trying to put in a, an exemption so that you can run lights all year, if they just happen to be small enough, just seems like an odd thing to do to me. So I would prefer we just <laughs> we just do it the way we are. I mean, you know, you could you, you have the same argument, right? Somebody could come in and say, well, you know, maybe maybe the maybe the safe glazing should only be eighty percent instead of ninety percent, right? And I, you know, I, I think that I think that this has been. Um, I think I think people underestimate the the, the use of lighting in, in the pursuit of happiness, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, it, it's an accent light to your to your fence. It's a you know, it's the ability to and and they're all controllable, right? But but we've banned it all, right? You can't even have the option in, in a new place. Um, you know, it's it's the it's the it's the lighting that you put around your fence that you turn on when you're entertaining. Maybe you do like four or five times a year, right? But you can't do that anymore after this rule, right? Um, it's, it's the floodlights that you have. So when a friend comes and visits you, you turn them on, right? Well, can't do that anymore after this rule, right? I mean, it's not like you're gonna leave that thing on all day and all night, your neighbors would kill you, right? I mean, it's like, stop, like turn that thing off. I mean, like we're all trying to go to sleep, but, but it's, it's those, in, those occasions. And you just taken that away from someone's pursuit of happiness is, is what I'm saying. I mean, people don't leave these things on all night just to you know annoy the birds, that's, that's not the intention, right? And so meanwhile, you know, 
all new developments, think about it, all new residential developments, like, okay, count those on like, I don't know, the back of our hand, we can't even get those things built. Okay, fine. Right? All new residential developments is, is, is a very, very small amount, right? So if you've got a residential exception, I'd be okay with it, right? I mean, this, this, it's not going to make a big deal. Even if you want to get down to single family home exemption, that's fine too, right? Uh, so, but but it's you know the the big polluters are still going to be there. So like we're, we are we are kidding ourselves in this, right? I mean, Main Street, uh, Valco is probably not ex you know it's probably exempt anyways, right? All the big commercial areas are exempt. Apple's exempt. I mean, Apple's is big glowing white thing that's on all the time, you know. So uh, I, we are kidding ourselves is what I'm trying to say. That's all. Chair Moore, could I clarify a couple of things if you allow me to? I um, won't take please. that long. So, I, I just I just want to clarify that there was no uh, there was no alternative motives for for SAV to to merge two items together for all the reasons that you stated, uh, Chair. Uh, and uh, we we heard you uh, as a commission last time uh, and all your concerns. And I will believe that we addressed those concerns this time. We did not hear a, a consensus on the desire to split the items. Although we we would have. But again, Chair Moore, for all the reasons you you stated, which is why we merged them together, I just want to clarify: there's no there's no alternative motives here. We're not trying to sneak one through or anything like that. It's just, again, for the reasons that you, you spoke, I appreciate that, and I just want to clarify that. So thank you. Okay, excellent. Um, thank you. And Bob, no, can I clarify just one other thing? Um, you know, please. Decorative lighting would still be allowed as long as they meet the lighting and illumination standards and the downward lighting standards. Um, so there, there is no uh, uh, reason to say that the, all that the lighting along the fence would not be allowed or, or things like that. They would still be allowed as long as it doesn't um, go over into the neighbor's yard. So just, just trying to clarify Those that. Those lights are pretty wimpy lights. Um, they are 20% more expensive. I was just looking at Title 24 lights right now. I was just like going through the website, seeing what it is. So they're more expensive. They're wimpier. And, and, and you look at them, you're like, oh. That doesn't accomplish. It doesn't accomplish what you're trying to accomplish from from the effect. So that's all. I mean, but but yeah. But you know, the light the light alternatives that are provided, right, are, are restrictive. Is what I'm saying. So. Right, but that's the whole point of what we're discussing, isn't it? In terms of the dark sky <laughs> element, is to is to somewhat limit the yeah. The but, amount but the of coverage light. area is so little. The coverage so, area is so little. I mean, if 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 you were gonna go. And I'm not proposing this either, okay? But if, if the argument was, let's go retro on every single thing from Main Street to Apple to everything else, and you really want dark skies, right, and right, there's a 10-year right. period. But, but we're, not, period. we're not going retro, is my understanding. No, no, but if you wanted to accomplish dark skies, that's what oh, you would do. Uh -huh. right? well, that's what I'm well, saying. No, but, but we're going right. after the little guy, like the residential person who who's there, when, when your bigger problem is over here, and I'm just arguing you're not accomplishing that either. Mm -hmm. so I'm um, could, could staff comment on what impacts we'll have on on uh, commercial sites uh, yes. aside from the side from the trees with a decorative lighting thank you yeah the, <laughs> the, they would be required to come to be consistent with all the requirements um so shielded downward lit on um, certain uh, foot lamperts um the other thing would be you know turning off at 11 p.m it's pretty much consistent um they're it's it's meant to be these rules are meant to be applied across the board there's not um so, anyone more or less um impacted by this yeah and, and as you said earlier generally speaking those those uh, regulations apply now mm -hmm. without even without this ordinance so you know yeah i ray i kind of understand this is a this is you I, I think you're you're maybe saying this is a law that's solving a problem that we don't really you know, we're, we're back in that territory of solving a problem we don't really have. But I think that the objective is really, you know, there's a certain amount of light that we emit today. Uh, this object, the objective here is to reduce, reduce that amount going forward. And that's, and that I think is actually a good thing. I think what I'm trying to say is the surface area, if you're to take a map of Cupertino and you, and you, you, you identify where all the big light polluters are, it's not going to be the single family homes. And, and that's one way of saying the same thing that you said, David. Um, and, and I think what I'm also trying to say is like, if you're really trying to address this problem, you would address the commercial side and you'd actually find a transition point for the commercial properties that are actually the big light polluters, right? And, and say, we get, we're going to transition all this to downlighting. We're going to transition this to low lumens and here's your 11 p.m. curfew. 
yeah. right? And you wouldn't punish the uh, single family homeowners who are just going to have some fun like once, once or twice, you know, like, you know, a year where they have a big party and a picnic, right? Right. And, and that's really what I'm just trying to get at. But we, we, we trying to solve a problem, walk away and say, yeah, we, we got this great policy win. Look at this. We did dark skies. Um, when, when it's going to have this much of an effect in the city, that's, that's what I'm trying to get to. So I would be supportive if you said, hey, look, let's go to commercial, give them a 10-year transition plan, and go out and say, look, we're going to reduce your total lumens and lamperts to this level, and you've got 10 years to comply, and this is what, this is what we're trying to do to accomplish dark skies, and, and leave the single family of homeowners alone. Okay. I, would staff I like to tackle that? Uh, the, staff. the flip side of that is that 95, you know, 90 or 95 percent of the of the uh, area in Cupertino is single family homes. So that they're actually not the is, pollutants. but they're not the pollutants. Well, I don't know if you actually if you actually weigh the amount of light being emitted, you may find that it's very difficult, even for a business with a spotlight pointing into the sky. It's very difficult for them to overcome the effect of 95 percent of the rest of the space. It's just leaking. Mm -hmm. Do a Google Earth map. I, I don't have one with me right now. And you'll see that it's not, the light emission isn't coming from the single family homes. I mean, in Monta Vista is pretty dark where you live. Even here in Rancho, it's pretty dark. The only areas are, are the lit areas for like all the shopping centers, right? And and all the highways that we have and the areas that are just required by law from safety uh, and the commercial buildings. But I'm, I'm being, I mean, someone should just do a map and you'll see it. That's all. So, um, but, I was wondering but, if staff could talk about are, are we making having any impact on the uh, street lights that we have in the in the community? Any changes there? No changes in there. We did talk to Public Works about those type of lightings, and um, there's just too there's too many concerns in, in terms of safety um, for drivers and pedestrians that um, they recommended not making any changes to the street lights. Okay, okay, because I, I would have to say with regards to the street lighting, it would be great if we had more uniformity um, mm -hmm. going through neighborhoods where we, and and you this was something that you were teaching us really is that having the light and dark areas is, is not great. Um, so hopefully moving forward, we can get to a more uniform lighting uh, and dimmer overall, right? Uh, right. Uh, so, but uh, there was a mention about about Valco. Um, so Valco would have to, uh, you know, when they pull permits, they and, and if this is a, this ordinance is approved before they're pulling permits, they would have to comply with this ordinance. Seth, you want Seth, you want to comment on that? Sure. Yeah. Um, so you know, the city we've 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 looked into this our position right now is that the ordinance would would apply to the sb35 project to but to the extent that there's no conflict between the new requirements of the ordinance and the sb35 project plans as they were approved back in uh, 2018 so if there is no conflict then pursuant to sb35 the ordinance can't um or rather does not change uh these aspects of the the approved plans all that said, um, you know, this is a obviously a new area of law. Um, and uh, just in the past several hours, actually, today, some new legal arguments were advanced about how the the uh, implementing this new ordinance might overlap or affect the approved projects. So um, we're taking a cautious approach of, you know, evaluating those arguments um, and would need to look more closely at the approved ordinance and the project plans approved back in 2018 to, you know, make sure our, our, uh, our position is, is still the same. And of course, position is subject to change if we, if we find something different. Uh, oh, okay. Cause that, that's very interesting. Cause you know, there were the reach codes were, have been approved since, since that time. And now we have potentially, um, you know, the bird safe design, you've got those, those really tall towers. Um, so it'd be yeah, so a shame. Sorry. It'd be the same if they weren't uh, if the the um, ordinance didn't apply to the tall towers um, with regards to the bird safe design. So the re the reach code is a totally separate animal because um, the building code application um, with regard to you know prior approved projects is just is dealt with differently under state law, um, which we don't need to get into now. But that so that's that's not really an analogy here. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. 
So you were, so it's not entirely clear is what you're telling me exactly if the bird safe design is going to apply, but yep. we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Uh, yeah. All right. So, uh, did I have a second on the on my friendly amendment regarding the did, string? Alan. Alan. Okay. So, uh, uh, did anyone have some further comments, or shall we uh, take this to a vote and see what happens? I'm not seeing any further comments. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you call the vote? Okay. Here we go, Vice Chair Wong. No. Commissioner Takahashi? Aye. Commissioner Fung? Aye. Commissioner Saxena? Aye. And Chair Moore? Aye. Okay, the motion passes 4-1-0 with Vice Chair Wang, but no. <clears throat> All right. And I, I want to thank staff for all of your work on this project and uh, educating us on, on this matter. It's been really important and informative. And of course, now I can't find my agenda. Here we go. Yay, I got it. All right. So now we have completed item four and we're moving on. We have uh, no old business or new business. Do we have any staff and commission reports? No staff reports. Great. Uh, I, I don't, this is not exactly a commission report, but I did attend a, the, uh, on Zoom, the CUSD board meeting last week, and they're looking at uh, potentially closing several schools, uh, which is, uh, it was alarming. Are there any other commissioner reports? Uh. Yeah, I also spoken in the previous CSD meeting, attended the one this one also. And there's also a CSD United effort to uh, tell the board from all the schools to defer the decision of school closure as much as possible. Um, um, and I'm hoping that the city council can help pitch in uh, till we know what happens to Prop 15 and other things which can help elevate some of the funding challenges. Uh, so, um, I hope the rest of the city institutions come together to prevent school closure at this time. Okay, are there any other commissioner reports? Okay, hearing none, I call this meeting adjourned. Good night, everybody. Good night.